All right, it's just about seven o'clock. <laughs> I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Roberta Jordan. I'm the Outreach and Instruction Librarian at Patent Free Library. And I'm here with Laurel Cox, who's another uh, reference librarian at the library, and Susan Beagle and Hillary Justice. Um, uh, Laurel and I are gonna be in the background very soon. Um, we're gonna be handling the Q&A, which is down at the bottom of your screen. Um, and is where we'll be taking questions uh, for Susan and Hillary once they've spoken. Um, I first wanted to uh, thank you all for coming out on such a nice evening um, before I introduce our main speaker. Um, and, uh, and then just give you as much time as possible to answer questions after Susan speaks. Um, but before I formally introduce her, I'd like to thank Susan so much for offering to do this program for the library. Um, she's so generous with her time and her talent, and she's such a real champion of so many of our library programs. So it's a privilege to have her here tonight to share her experiences and her expertise. And, um, and here's a little background on the expertise part. Um, as you know, Susan Beagle's here tonight because she was an advisor and a talking head on this week's PBS documentary on Ernest Hemingway that was directed by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. She has a PhD in English from Yale University where she did her doctoral dissertation on Ernest Hemingway. Um, she's a Hemingway scholar with more than 35 years of experience. She's published two books about him and is the author of more than 50 scholarly articles on aspects of American literature and history. For more than two decades, she served as the editor of the Hemingway Review, a journal of research and scholarship about the author's life and works. Um, Susan will uh, take it from here and she'll introduce her guest. Um, and she'll talk for about 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll open it up to the floor for questions. So you'll have to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can by eight o'clock. Um, so, Laurel and I are gonna disappear now and turn it over to Susan. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you, Hillary. So hi, I'm Susan Beagle, and I wanna welcome you to this evening's Q&A about the new Hemingway documentary by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. So here's the plan. Um, first, I'm gonna give you all a short talk about my experience with this film, hoping that an inside look might be fun for you. And then we want to leave plenty of time to answer your questions about the film or anything you'd like to discuss concerning Hemingway's life and work. While I'm talking, um, your job is to think about what questions you want to ask, bearing in mind that we might not be able to get to everyone, but be thinking about questions and have them ready. Secondly, um, we have a surprise guest this evening, my friend, Dr. Hillary Justice. I think Hillary was planning on lurking, um, but I drafted her. Hillary is Hemingway scholar in residence at the John F. Kennedy Library in Boston. And she also served as an advisor to this film in a unique behind the scenes capacity. Most of the manuscripts, photographs, moving picture clips and typewriters that you see in the film are housed at the Kennedy. And in addition, Hillary's kind of a Renaissance uh, woman. She has studied music as well as literature. And she's a gifted performer on piano and on handbells. And as a result, Hillary has published on Hemingway's musical education and also cataloged his record collection at his Cuban home. So Hillary uh, wound up providing advice on the film soundtrack. So she's going to join me in taking questions um, when I'm done and be thinking about questions for her because she does have those unique areas of expertise as well as being a Hemingway expert. So I wanted to start by saying that I've worked on eight different Hemingway films prior to this one, seven documentaries and a made for TV movie. And I mentioned that because those experiences have helped me to appreciate why a Ken Burns film is really different. Because Hemingway's life is so overstuffed, four wives, six wars, locations around the world, six of these films were on limited subjects. Hemingway in Idaho, Hemingway in Cuba, Hemingway and Martha Gellhorn, Hemingway and Mary, Gary Cooper, a Japanese film on Hemingway and Agnes von Kurowski, a German film on Hemingway in Spain in 1937. 
Only two of the films I worked with attempted to tackle Hemingway's life in its entirety. And sadly, one of those films, an extremely promising beginning, had to be shelved when a talented young filmmaker realized the overwhelming scope and cost of the project. So that left DeWitt Sage's Rivers to the Sea, a 90 minute life of Ernest Hemingway for the PBS American Masters series. And as I'm sure you realize after watching the Burns and Novick six hour life of Hemingway, 90 minutes is no time at all for telling this huge sprawling story, but it is the typical length of a TV documentary. A seasoned documentarian with quite a few successful films for PBS under his belt, including one on F. Scott Fitzgerald, DeWitt was able to pull off a life of Hemingway in that time frame, which is really difficult to do, 90 minutes, but naturally it only scratches the surface. So when you serve as an advisor on a documentary, things usually start with a phone call or an email or maybe even lunch with the director. They ask if you'll help, and if you say yes, you might have to write a letter of support for a National Endowment for the Humanities grant proposal. Next, if you get a copy of the script written by the director. These films are labors of love and your job is to help the director with any advice he or she needs. You mark up the script, correcting any mistakes, and you leave the director's story alone unless you have some important information that they don't have. You send the script back and then you never talk to anyone else at all about it or hear about it again. Your other function as an advisor on a typical film is to provide information and do research. Assistants call you with questions that arise during filming. One of my all-time favorite and most challenging questions was from DeWitt Sage's crew, who emailed me to ask what kind of pencils Hemingway wrote with during his pencil days. I don't know about you, but I, I don't have a lot of information about French pencils of the 1920s on the tip of my tongue. On the TV movie, I enjoyed working with a makeup artist who needed detailed information about Hemingway's scars for a sex scene. I hunted down lots of pictures for her to work with. But now let's turn to our Ken Burns, Lynn Novick film about Hemingway, which started as a typical experience. I got the usual phone call asking if I would be willing to serve as an advisor and yes, please, I was thrilled. But then the script arrives and this time, the script is by Jeffrey Ward, whose biographer Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a Pulitzer finalist. Jeff holds seven Emmy Awards for documentary film writing, and he was for many years before his retirement editor of American Heritage, which is a publication of the Smithsonian Museum of American History. And Jeff's script has got something I have never seen on a script before, footnotes, uh-oh. So this isn't a person who is going to need a lot of fact checking from me. I mark up the script, I type up my comments, which mostly concern matters of interpretation or additional information from sources that Jeff hasn't used. And to try to keep up with him, I actually wind up footnoting my comments. I expect to send the marked up script back and never hear about it again as usual, but instead I get an invitation to an advisory council meeting in New York and find myself and my copy of the script walking into one of those glassed in conference rooms that's called a shark tank. Around the table are Ken Burns and co-director Lynn Novick, producer Sarah Botstein, writer Jeff Ward, and Michael Katakis from the Hemingway Estate. Also present are three other scholar advisors, a fine Hemingway biographer, a noted generalist in American literature, and the head of the Hemingway Letters Project. Seated against the wall is the research team, a small army of phenomenally bright young people taking notes on any books, manuscripts, images, music, or film clips we might mention. Advisors on Ken Burns films may offer ideas and clues, but they're obviously not going to be doing the research themselves. He has a research team for that. So we spend three entire days sharing our thoughts on the script. We discuss, we correct, we tell alternative stories, we suggest illustrative materials, we answer questions, we ask questions, and we argue about interpretations. Sometimes we argue passionately. Um, both Ken Burns and Lynn Novick listen and say very little, and Ken tells us quite firmly when it's time to move on. Jeff Ward, too, mostly listens quietly. 
he is a saint in my eyes. I cannot imagine subjecting something I've written to three whole days of scrutiny like that. And he's very quiet, but sometimes Jeff pushes back with tough, hard to answer questions that make us dig deeper. It is a super collaborative process and hugely exciting to be with a group of specialists like this who are performing at the top of their game and maybe competing a little bit with each other over a film that may reach as many as 34 million viewers. Okay, after that, I go home, I get emails from Jeff, and so I'm sure to the other advisors wanting to know my sources for th some things that I said in the meeting. So you know that input from the Shark Tank is going back into a revision of the script, and you know that in a Ken Burns film, the team fact checks the advisors and not the other way around. Next, I get a call to come back to New York to be interviewed by Ken Burns, which was pretty exciting <laughs> for me anyway. In the past, when I've had talking head gigs, the director has either interviewed me at a conference where he is interviewing other people too, or at my home with a pickup crew from the area. Ken Burns, however, brings me to New York and has a top of the line crew. And I'll just mention the makeup artist, although I wish I had time to tell you about the sound guy who was very special as well. On other films I've worked with, there hasn't been any makeup, just powder to keep your face from shining under the Klieg lights. I don't wear makeup or get my hair professionally cut. You can probably tell by looking at me or any of that stuff. It's not me and I really don't like it at all. Um, but co-director Lynn Novick tells me we film in HD. So trust me, you want makeup and they're going to insist. So I'm very nervous when I meet this lovely young woman and I tell her that I don't wear makeup, my hair is naturally frizzy, I don't want it smooth, and that the only thing I ever have on me sometimes is chapstick. And she gently tells me that she's just going to hydrate my skin a bit and I should have a seat. So while she is putting this stuff that feels absolutely wonderful on my face, she says in the most therapeutic way, it sounds like you've had a bad experience with makeup. Tell me about it. So I tell her about this makeup artist for a news show who made me look like an evil clown in a Stephen King movie. And she says, your preference for no visible makeup isn't unusual. In fact, Meryl Streep is the same way. And then she says, don't worry, I promise you that when I'm done, you'll still look exactly like yourself, only better. Now I'm sure that she says that to all her reluctant clients but it's reassuring to know that your desire not to look like a clown isn't abnormal and that your makeup artist has worked on Meryl Streep. <laughs> she finishes up and says, now you don't have to if you don't want to, but Meryl usually has just the tiniest bit of blush and I decide it's probably okay. So um, Ken and I get going on the interview, which lasts a fairly typical three hours. And here, let me point out that no matter how personally thrilling this was for me, Ken and Lynn separately interviewed more than 100 people for the Hemingway documentary. Um, okay, so I can tell from the finished film that he asked each of us some of the same questions. We were all asked which was our favorite Hemingway work and which was our least favorite. A lot of these answers are in the film. This puts interviewees in dialogue with each other. John McCain loves For Whom the Bell Tolls. Maria Vargas Llosa thinks it's Hemingway's worst novel. He loves The Old Man in the Sea. Edna O'Brien thinks The Old Man in the Sea is tripe. She loves The Farewell to Arms and on. We were also asked before we came to choose three passages from Hemingway's work that we think are exceptionally fine and to be prepared to read them out loud. And in the film, this reads to many, leads to many nice readings, either by interviewees like Edna O'Brien um, or by a voiceover actor like Jeff Daniels. And it also leads to many of the times you see talking heads discussing a number of gorgeous passages in Hemingway's work. Of course, no surprise, Ken Burns is a great interviewer. He makes you comfortable and asks good questions to draw you out. But we were warned in advance that we would have to discuss something that absolutely no one wanted to talk about on camera. And that's Hemingway's horrible letter about James Jones that you will certainly remember if you watched the film. And if you didn't, I'm not going to tell you about it because I don't want to talk about it. Now, Ken's strategy is to wait until you are fully relaxed and really tired 
when you've forgotten that this might be coming or you think he's forgotten to ask. And that's when he bushwhacks you. And when you watch the film, you can see Tobias Wolf visibly recoil and a damn it expression cross his face before he starts his answer. I had training in high school actually and with withstanding hostile cross-examination. So it's really, really hard to get a rise out of me, especially if I'm expecting it. But Ken Burns got me to lose it big time, absolutely big time. He looked quite pleased. Watching the final version on TV, I was praying he, he would not use what I said, and I'm really grateful he didn't. <clears throat> and finally, Ken did something I've never had an interviewer do before that almost gave me a heart attack. I was talking about Hemingway's traumatic experiences at the catastrophic World War II battle of Hurricane Forest, and I felt like I was doing a good job. And that's when I noticed that Ken's eyes are closed. His head is tipping back and his eyes are closed. And I'm thinking, oh my God, Susan, good job. Ken Burns is so bored, he's falling asleep. Ha, you know, I was, it, yeah, threw me for a loop. Anyway, afterwards, he told me that what I had said about the battle made him want to cry. And I'm like, what? He wasn't falling asleep. What was that about? Well, later I realized that he had closed his eyes in order to picture what I was talking about in my head. The Hurtgen Forest section of the film is beautifully imaged to express trauma. Um, so no surprise, he has an interior visual imagination and he just does this thing where he shifts from listening to seeing what you're saying. Once recorded, interviews are transcribed and the team minds them for selects. Select is another word for the sound bite that will go into the film. But uh, Florentine, Ken Burns' company, doesn't just use interviews for on-camera moments. All of them are treated as additional information for the script. So once more, I'm getting emails from Jeff Ward asking for the sources of things I said. And being an old Hemingway scholar and having been in the business a long time, I don't always remember where I read something. All scholars know what a nightmare this is. But it's un unthinkable not to be able to document something that you said on camera. And I wind up with half my library on my study floor hunting for one quotation from Mary Hemingway that did finally make its way into the film. Huh. Um, I've never worked with a film that uses interviews to go deeper like this. Other filmmakers usually just record the interviews, plug in their selects, and we're done. On other films, I've only been asked to look at a rough cut one time, and that director sent a DVD for me to look at at home alone and ask for corrections only. In the world of Ken Burns, after a few months pass, you get a call to go and view a rough cut of the film at his studio in Walpole, New Hampshire. I'm expecting the same group from the Shark Tank, but no, this is different. It's a much larger group at least 25 people, some from the Shark Tank, some not, a group with lots of different backgrounds and areas of expertise. <clears throat> Hillary, for example. And of course, Ken, Lynn, Jeff, Sarah, and the research team are there, but now Florentine's technical wizards and film editors are there too. A rough cut is a draft of the film that's missing some pieces. Staff members read the voiceover, you don't pay Jeff Janos to voice Hemingway until the script is final. Images have watermarks because you don't ask for permissions or pay rights until the final choices are made. The soundtrack is unfinished. There are no sound effects. Everything is on the table. Anything can still be changed, we're told. We meet in a screening room in a beautiful old barn that Ken has converted to a mini conference center. And we sit at long rows of tables like students in a lecture hall. We are not allowed to have scripts. Ken wants our eyes on the screen. And there we will spend two long days watching each episode and afterwards critiquing and discussing and arguing together about what we've seen and about the new set of problems to solve. When we're done, we'll be given copies of the script and asked to annotate it with our suggestions. It's like final exams as we are all sitting at long tables writing away and trying to finish before it's time to leave. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the staff are sitting in another room, collating comments from the rough cut discussion into a master document and arguing about them as they go. It was another exhilarating experience. 
So there's just one more thing I want to say before we go to questions. When I have worked on other films, I have always known what my contribution has been. I corrected certain mistakes, found this image or that information, persuaded them to put this scene in or take that one out. But with a Ken Burns film, you don't really have a clue. You just know you played a small part in an enormous team undertaking. And I'll just give you an example. <clears throat> Jeff's script calls for discussion of the competitive relationship between Hemingway and his wife, Martha Gellhorn. Someone on the research team pulls a photo of Ernest and Ma Martha arguing to illustrate that. You recognize that the photo by Robert Kappa is cropped to show just their faces arguing with each other. And you suggest that someone needs to pull back and show it at full length. So viewers can see that Ernest and Martha are hunting and that there is a barbed wire fence between them and that they each have a shotgun over one's arm, over one arm. Ken's face lights up because he's famous for his techniques to make still photos come alive. Later, after the meeting, before the voiceover actors come on board, someone else begins researching quotations from Martha Gellhorn. That person finds a beauty where Martha talks about how she and Ernest <clears throat> were violent people and afraid of each other. Meryl Streep voices it. Her reading provides a voiceover for the Kappa photograph. So if you remember that little bit from the film and it made an impression, there were six or seven people involved. Equally, the Kent Burns team actually corrects, improves, and changes the opinions of its advisors. It's not a one-way process. Jeff Ward, for instance, is not only an, an historian and biographer, he's also a career-long editor of Scholars. And I know, for instance, that pushback from him in the Shark Tank got me thinking, and my response in my interview made it into the film. On a Ken Burns film, then, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Everybody pushes everyone else a little bit higher. It's an incredibly exciting process to be involved with in even the smallest way, and I'm incredibly grateful to have had the opportunity because it really was a lifetime experience. So now I want to open up and Hillary and I will do our best to answer your questions. All right. I'm coming back <clears throat> to start fielding questions. Thank you, Susan. That was great. Um, um, let me just uh, reiterate, because while uh, Susan was talking, a few people tried to raise your hand and we'd much prefer it if you type your question into the Q&A feature that's at the bottom of your screen <clears throat> rather than calling on people with raised hands. Um, so um, we'll start with um, some of the ones in the Q&A that have come in while you're talking. Um, one of which I think would apply to both of you. Um, and I think um, it's from uh, Leslie Mortimer. Why Hemingway? And I, I think you, why did you both end up with Hemingway as your specialty? And um, when, what was that moment that made you decide that he was going to be your life's work? Hillary, why don't you start that one? <laughs> uh, I, I came into it sideways. I was an undergraduate music major and my area of interest was Renaissance music manuscripts. And then I decided I wanted to teach high school, but I wanted to teach English, not music. So I was like, I'm going to need to go get a master's degree. And so completely innocently, I wandered into a class titled Hemingway Short Fiction Through the Manuscripts. And I was like, well, I don't know about Hemingway, but manuscripts I can do. Um, and that was a class taught by Paul Smith at Trinity in Connecticut. And it turns out manuscripts I could do. And I was still thinking very much like a musician. And so in going through Hemingway's various drafts of his short fiction, it struck me that his early works um, very much worked similarly to music. And that got me curious. So for a presentation in his class, I ended up with, I was assigned to do Hills Like White Elephants, the short story. And there was this one thing about the manuscript that just drove me nuts and drove me nuts. Um, and I finally published my first article on what drove me nuts in the manuscript to Hills Like White Elephants about four years later. So I was actually a, an accidental Hemingway scholar. Um, but once you let him in, he doesn't let you go. I don't know, you want my answer? Because it's kind of overlapping a little bit. I was uh, looking for a subject for a doctoral dissertation. Um, and I looked in the back of, of 
PMLA magazine, which is a, a professional magazine for people in English, and it had a list of sort of calendar of events. And there was a conference at the John F. Kennedy Library um, about Hemingway celebrating the opening of the Hemingway collections at the library. And, the new, and it was being held by the newly founded Hemingway Society. So I said, well, you know, that would be a pleasant drive, you know, from Connecticut. And maybe I'll just go up there, register for this conference, go up there and see what's going on. And um, I was cut, I, I was very interested in Hemingway for completely different reasons from Hillary. Um, I love his realism. And I really clicked with him when I was on, a, went to Africa and I had read Green Hills before I left. And I was looking out the plane window going, Oh my God, I have actually been here before. How did he do that? Um, <clears throat> really crazy. But anyway, I went to the conference at the library and who should I meet but the new president um, of the Hemingway Society, the first president who was Paul Smith. This is what Hillary and I had in common. And I told him I was looking for a subject to work on. And he said, well, come with me. And he took me upstairs and introduced me to the curator of uh, the Hemingway manuscripts. And so I think a weird thing about both Hillary and I is that although Paul Smith was not the director of our doctoral dissertations and wasn't at our universities at all, he's really <laughs> uh, the person behind them both. Um, Thank you both. Um, this is a, a similar question that we have for you. Um, now knowing your background, we're curious, a couple of people are actually out there asking this question. We're curious about the authors that were included um, in the PBS documentary. And if either of you in your advisory capacities were part of selecting them. And if so, why those particular authors and what was their connection to Hemingway? Um, you know, what sort of made them writers that were um, of choice to, to speak? That wasn't something we got super involved with. Um, some of the authors had been chosen uh, before the advisory council got put together by the, by the film crew. Um, some of them, you know, were people, people that the film team knows really well. John McCain, for instance, is, is um, well known for his love of, of For Whom the Bell Tolls, um, but Ken already knew him really well from his Vietnam series. And so easy for him to go and talk to him. Um, Tobias Wolf is somebody who has, has been strongly influenced by Hemingway and really vocal about it. Um, his novel, Old School, um, features quite a bit about Hemingway in it. We did talk a little bit at the advisory meeting about other authors that we might like to see. And I remember being, I, I love Abraham Verghese. Um, I don't know why Edna O'Brien was chosen. Do you, Hillary? But wow, was she know. fantastic. She was she amazing. Was amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. And I think, I think that was someone that Lynn chose. So, you know, a little bit, little bit serendipitous, but really wanting to get some different kinds of voices, um, men and women um, who, who are great writers talking about Hemingway's influence and what they think of him as an artist. I actually, um, I didn't have anything to do with, with any of the writers being selected, but I know that they, spent a lot of time talking to Ernest Hemingway's son, Patrick. And I know that Patrick mentioned some writers and I think they, they took his lead on a couple of them. I'm not sure which ones. They made a big effort too to go for diversity. Um, Mario Vargas Llosa, for instance, who was also very wonderful. You know, you really you can't talk about Hemingway without having an Hispanic writer comment that would be insane so to have someone of his caliber was great and he was he also was one of my favorite interviews in the film especially laughing about the sleeping bag scene <laughs> and uh, for whom the bell tolls um, but also expressing his you know really appreciation of old man in the sea um 
uh, I've had, we have several people in the Q&A that have asked whether or not you're willing to share, Susan, what you said, but wasn't included regarding Hemingway and James Jones. Um, I'll, I'll, all right, I'll tell you a little bit. I'm calmer now. <laughs> I'm not even sure what I said when, when um, Ken Burns asked me that question, because I think I just leapt out of my chair. Um, I think that letter is truly pathological. And um, Ken said at the beginning, he didn't want the film to get clinical about the things that were wrong with Hemingway. Oh, there were a lot wrong with the, the concussions and the, the family history and the pouring down the alcoholism on that. I don't think the film ever imagined that Hemingway had adult onset diabetes. So he had circulatory problems. Um, he had malignant high blood pressure. Um, that kind of thing can happen to people when certain areas of the brain are injured and affected. And I don't know if you remember another quote elsewhere in the film, which might have been in the same place where Hemingway's talking about, I hear myself saying these terrible things and I cannot stop myself. Um, so there's that going on. But there's also something else that never got mentioned is that James Jones wasn't just a hot new novelist coming out of the World War II generation. He was now Scribner's best-selling author. So not only you know, was he pushing Hemingway for the limelight, he had bumped him off his throne at his own publishing house. It's not an accident that that letter is to Charles Scribner who had made the mistake of asking Hemingway if he didn't think James Jones was a brilliant writer. <laughs> Bad question. Um, Charles Scribner too is someone who was very prissy, very, very prissy. And, you know, famously in the Hemingway rela relationship, shocked by coarse language, always asking him to take coarse language out of his books. And so I just imagining this really drunk, out of control person <laughs> deciding that he's going to, he's not just nuking James Jones there, he's nuking Charles Scribner. And Charles Scribner had a heart attack not long after that. I'm sure there was no connection, but it is a horrible, horrible letter. Um, yeah, pathological, that's all I'm going to say about it, but there are reasons behind it reasons behind it. So it sounds like you're grateful that your um, segment didn't make it in. Are there things that you wish had made it in or that um, we've had a couple of questions about, you know, things that could have, you wish had, had there had been more time to emphasize or had been included. Um, do either of you have things that you wish, you know, there were eight hours and could have been <laughs> included? Hillary, you want to you want to go with that? I um, I wish they could have done more with the beauty of the later writing, despite the tremendous mental and physical um, meltdown that happened over the course of the last years of Hemingway's life. It's it's just astonishing to me that he was still able to produce passages of such transcendent power and beauty despite all of that. So I would have liked another, I, would, I think I would have liked another, well, I'd, like, I'd have liked another three episodes basically, you know, um, but I'm greedy. The, but the loss I think um, from the six hours that I felt most keenly is stopping the focus as much on the writing and turning it into the, let's face it, very compelling tragedy that was playing out in Hemingway's life? Um, I think every single person in Hemingway studies regrets that there's something that's not in there. And you don't have to be in Hemingway studies. If, if, if you're a fan, you probably regret something. I mean, I hear people saying, I wish there was more about him being a cub reporter in Kansas City. I wish there was more about his friendship with Antonio Ordonez. Um, Everybody has a thing. I, I wish that we, we could have had a way to fold in a little bit more about his experiences during the 1918 influenza epidemic. 
um, for sure. But you, you, you have to leave stuff out. You cannot do a life of Hemingway without leaving stuff out. He himself said that the way a writer should judge his own work is by the excellence of the stuff cut out. Um, I, you know, as far as real regrets, I would have loved, and again, this is personal to me in a way, I would have loved to see the film do more with his education as a naturalist. I would have loved to see the film do more with the beauty of his writing. And I would especially wish that there had been more with the beauty of his writing about the sea, which is from the last part of his career. Um, you know, when I was asked my favorite passage from Hemingway, it's, it's a passage from Old Man where he's rowing out in the dawn and listening to the sound that the flying fish make when they leave the water. It's, it's just, you know, it's just beautiful. It's breathtaking. And um, you can never have too much of that, but, but something's gotta give. <laughs> This is a question we should have uh, uh, used as a follow-up when you were talking about the other authors. Um, uh, someone asked, why was Losa a Peruvian uh, interviewed instead of a Spanish or a Cuban author? Um, oh, know. we did have a Cuban author. We had Leonardo Padura. And uh, so there was a Cuban author. Um, Vargas Losa, I think it's just the magnitude of his, of his reputation you know, um, and Hemingway was involved with Hispanic cultures on, you know, both continents, <laughs> right? Um, Central America and South America, and um, Hemingway actually also only Hemingway, but he actually did spend some time in Peru, deep sea fishing. <laughs> <laughs> you really, you know, he's everywhere. <laughs> Uh, question, um, I guess, to both of you, uh, again, the, the pandemic, how did that play into um, the process, the production process? Was that, was most of it uh, sort of the filming and everything already done by the time um, everything shut down? And so that just the editing remained or how did that affect? Hillary, I'm sure you have pandemic stories because you did a lot of the work at, with the library closed, right? Yeah, actually, one of the last things that happened before the JFK library had to shut down um, was the film crew came to film the original manuscripts at the library. They don't travel. Um, a lot of what they worked with for the film were extraordinarily high resolution digital images, but you can't get the texture of the paper. You can't get the, the indentation of the pencil on the paper, the impression of the typewriter. So all of those scenes with the typewriter and the original pages, those were filmed at the JFK library. And uh, the film crew had actually just come back from France and all of a sudden we all looked at each other and said, oh my gosh, COVID, what's gonna happen? Now nobody was sick, nobody was you know contagious, but um, that was the last thing that happened on the Hemingway side at the JFK before we shut down a year ago, March. At that point, um, as Susan mentioned during the rough cut screening, they don't have final images of things. Um, some of the documents that they showed in the film, they had been working from sort of lower resolution images. We don't know what we're gonna need, final resolution size. So they, they had the final list of what they needed high resolution scans of, but not all of those scans existed yet. So there was a while there where everyone was holding their breath, but luckily um, our reopening happened in phases. And the time when they needed those scans done happens to be when we entered the phase that allowed certain staff back on site to do tasks like that. So it was, it was really a miracle of timing that was looking out for it. Yeah, from, from my perspective, I don't know uh, a great deal, but when we left the rough cut, uh, Ken said to me, see you soon. Like, we're going to be working together again with advisors. And of course, that never, that never happened. So that was sad. And I know um, they hadn't finished the, 
the voiceover is done, right? Because you, like I said, you wait till the script is done before you pay actors uh, to do that. And I know that they got their inter- their work with Jeff Daniels done before lockdown and that everybody has such a good time. All those wonderful young people on the research team because they get to go and they get to hear meet Jeff Daniels and hear Jeff Daniels read and, and you know, have the interaction with the directors about, you know, his readings. My favorite one is the suicide, the interior monologue about suicide from For Whom the Bell Soul said, do it, do it now passage was just, wow. But then lockdown came and they couldn't get to Meryl, Meryl Streep. I know I sound like I'm obsessed with her, but um, so she actually recorded her parts uh, from Martha Gellhorn alone in her son's studio. Um, and, and so there just wasn't that interaction. And of course, like I say, the young people on the team were crushed that they you know, missed their opportunity to work with these people. So it, it, it was difficult. And all of them, I think, you know, did a lot of work on Zoom from home, I can tell you that there are enormous and wonderful and excellent changes and additions to the film between the rough cut and what you saw on TV, especially in episode two. Um, so somehow they managed it. I don't know, like everybody else, it's just you figure it out and you get it done, but it kind of a shame. <laughs> and oh, I should, it also creates opportunities though. Okay. so. Normally they would fly all over the country doing the publicity rollout and go to individual PBS stations and this, that, and the other. Instead, they did a series of conversations online with all these different PBS stations and with different scholars and writers. And if you want to hear more, um, you can Google conversations, Ken Burns Hemingway, and and you will pull up a menu of them. They are not equal in quality. Um, But my favorite is the one, uh, the conversation about writing that happened at the Kennedy Library um, with, well, virtually, (laughs) it was hosted by the Kennedy Library virtually, um, with Ken and Lynn and Abraham Verghese and Tobias Wolf. It was, I love, that was my favorite. I don't know if Hillary has, probably has a favorite too. Um, Other than the one that was done at my home institution, (laughs) I think my favorite one uh, was the one that the community library in Idaho hosted with Idaho Public Television with the guest speaker, Terry Tempest Williams, who's a a writer who's always been very close to my heart. Um, I think that was my favorite, except of course that the Kennedy Library, the one that we hosted, that's obviously my very favorite, but watch the (laughs) Idaho one as well. The Idaho one's on Hemingway and the natural world. That's a, that's a good topic, yeah. Um, so we have several questions about um, Hemingway and his siblings later in life. Um, the um, wondering what what kind of relationship did he have with his siblings? And somebody in particular asked about whether he ever reconciled with his sister Carol. I don't really think so much. Um, those relationships were difficult, all of them. Every single sibling, every single, not every single sibling. Sonny was his favorite, Madeline. And I think Lester was young enough that he didn't really get caught up in a lot of it. I mean, he was so little when Hemingway left home. But he's, he's another one who commits suicide. Right. And Carol too, right? Carol's the other one? Pretty sure. And then he fought with his old, his one sister who was older than him, Marceline, about, you know, care of their mother and that kind of thing. And <laughs> Well, he fought with her about everything. So. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> that one's perhaps not so surprising. <laughs> well, he showed her the, he showed her up in Michigan you know, before it was excluded from everything else. And she read it on the way home and she was taking the train home and she thought, oh, Michigan, up in, this is gonna be such a nice story. And it was based on, you know, 
Hemingway wrote from life. He, he had a horrible time making up names. He, he made up excellent ones eventually, but often in his first drafts, he, he'd use real people's names. I think just it sparked an idea, it gave him a character, and then it would change as he went along and he'd go back and revise. But he, he started off with you know, people and relationships that Marceline could recognize from, from her experiences in the same town in Michigan as she was just horrified. And that was, that was early. Her, her response to him was basically, how dare you take something so wonderful and make it so ugly? And his response was, Marceline, I'm, I'm writing fiction. There's a truth in fiction. It's not those people. And she said, don't you dare ever show that to mother. We have um, some similar questions about uh, his sons. Uh, I, think, I think it was our um, director, Leslie, who said that the film left more questions than answers. Um, and I think some of that feeling comes from, you don't really get a little, you know, coda as you would in a, a, a regular film that says, you know, what happened to um, these characters. Uh, can you provide a little bit of, um, of a recap for uh, those of us uh, who are unfamiliar with um, Hemingway's sons and also his wives, what, what became of them after his death? <laughs> well, okay, wives are easier <laughs> to talk about. Um, Hadley married happily and, you know, lived more or less happily ever after, so far as we know. I think Pauline, the, the film, covered really well, um, got into that horrible, horrible argument with him about their son. She had an undiagnosed adrenal tumor. And that's the kind of thing that when you get excited and you get flooded with adrenaline, a normal person, their adrenal gland will shut off eventually. But um, if you have a tumor, it won't shut off. And your heart can't take it. So that's, that's what happened to um, Pauline. Martha went on to have an enormously successful career as a writer and a war correspondent. She went to uh, the Vietnam War as quite a, a senior woman. Um, she went through a number of affairs and marriages, but nobody ever nailed her down. <laughs> she could sort of tell that was going to happen. And Mary, um, lived when I got married died in 1986 and was an excellent excellent curator of his manuscripts and his legacy um but she was also an alcoholic and died of cirrhosis of the liver so there's that um the sons patrick is is still with us and very much involved um, with the Hemingway collection and administration of the estate and has been a wonderful supporter of, of Hemingway scholarship. And I should say that this film would not have been possible at all without the cooperation of the Hemingway estate because um, Hemingway is a 20th century writer and died in 61 and the majority the vast majority of everything he ever wrote or touched is still under copyright. And nobody could have done a film like this if they had had to purchase the rights to all the quotations that you heard and the manuscripts that you saw and the letters that were read and all of that. And they gave um, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick absolutely carte blanche and full cooperation. And so that makes this documentary like super, super, super special. Um, Gregory suffered from mental illness and I was he diagnosed bipolar and had a, a tragic, a tragic end. Um, and, and Jack had a, you know, he, he had a, a tough World War II. He, he was captured by the Germans behind enemy lines. He was in the OSS. Um, he was wounded. He was in a prisoner of war camp. His dad thought he was dead for a while. Um, got out, got married. Julia Child was a bridesmaid at his wedding. Um, yeah, I got a footnote here on Hadley. Um, oh, Hadley. Because, yeah, okay. yeah, she lived happily. See, Susan, Susan's the script. I'm the footnote here. Um, 
Hadley basically did have a happily ever after life. She married someone by the name of Paul Maurer um, and she had custody of her son with Ernest. But Hadley gets a curtain call in American literature. She and Paul show up as uh, the friends of Julia and Paul Child in Julia Child's My Life in France. Um, and Julia not only was the bridesmaid at Bumby Jack Hemingway's wedding, um, but she also cooked for and hosted the reception. And uh, Bumby's godmother, Alice B. Toklas attended. So that, that's Hadley's footnote. The other thing I just wanna say really quickly about the, the copyright, um, all the manuscripts are copyrighted. You can't just randomly go in and photocopy a million of them and, and publish them. The, the Hemingway Literary Estate owns the copyright to those. However, you can come into the, the Kennedy Library and work with them. Ken Burns and Lynn Novick didn't have special access to anything. Um, anyone can go in and see them. High school students can come in if they're curious on working on papers. Um, but Susan's right. The Hemingway family saying, you have carte blanche to show the manuscripts, use all the quotations. It was tremendously generous. So you don't have to be Ken Burns to see him, but you might have to be Ken Burns to quote him. Yeah, and here's a follow-up question to that. Um, someone asked how the Hemingway papers ended up at the JFK library to begin with. Susan, you want to take this one? No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> okay, really fast answer. Um, it all came about because, uh, because of two tragedies in the early 1960s. Hemingway and JFK never met. They corresponded very briefly a couple of times. Um, after Hemingway's death, Mary Hemingway got stuck. Her primary residence was in Cuba. All of her stuff was in Cuba. Hemingway's unfinished manuscripts were in Cuba and Americans couldn't get to Cuba. So she worked with the Kennedy White House to get special permission um, to go back and retrieve some of their belongings, including a lot of the papers that were published as posthumous works like A Movable Feast. Fast forward again, um, she had met the Kennedys very briefly socially, but fast forward again to after the president's assassination and Mary Hemingway sitting there holding in storage a lifetime's worth of papers and photographs and what is she gonna do with them? Um, Hemingway never went to college, so there was no college special collections in a library just waiting to receive his papers. She was looking for a home for them. She was talking to the New York Public Library she read that Mrs. Kennedy was putting together her husband's, her late husband's presidential library. So she wrote a letter to Mrs. Kennedy saying, I would like to offer you the Ernest Hemingway collection for inclusion in your husband's library if you think that's appropriate. And Mrs. Kennedy wrote back and it took her a while to respond. She said she was overwhelmed with the generosity. And there's this great Jackie Kennedy quote. She told Mary, I'd be honored to have Jack's papers in the Ernest Hemingway library. So it was actually these, these two women who, while grieving, were responsible to history and the legacies of their larger than life husbands. So it sounds like the majority of his papers are there then in that sort of a single repository as opposed to sometimes other authors end up spread out. Is that right? Yeah, yeah we have over 90% of his known papers and that's you know drafts and manuscripts of almost every work. Um, incoming and outgoing correspondence, anything that was on paper. Hemingway was like a researcher's dream. He just kept everything. It's almost as though he knew that we were gonna you know, need to find the note to the French landlord and, the, and that would be the whole key to everything. You know, it's not quite that bad. Um, but we've got all of those. We've got 11,000 photographs belonging to just Ernest and Mary um, from the Hemingway family. We've got supporting collections from some of the professional photographers who followed Hemingway around on various assignments. So it's, it's really the Global Center for, for Research into Hemingway's um, works, his life, the correspondence, most of it's there. So yeah, researchers are, are really lucky. And On the other hand, it's, it seems like there's a number of um, geographic locations that claim him as well. Um, some, somebody asked what happened to Hemingway's home um, after Castro um, overthrew Batista in 1959. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, the different places that claim him. Mary, um, Mary donated the Finca Vigia, the home in Cuba, and Hemingway's boat, Pilar, um, to the people of Cuba. 
at Fidel Castro's request. He met with her at the Finca when she went down to get the papers. He facilitated her getting those papers out. She couldn't have gotten them out without his help. Uh, some of them were in the safe deposit vault at a bank, which had been nationalized um, by the Cubans. And um, so the home and the boat and every, and he, and he allowed her to take personal belongings out, including the papers, but there were some papers she left behind for the Cuban people to, to have and to look at. They have now been preserved and there are now copies of those papers at the Kennedy. So you can read the Cuban papers there as well. Um, but it is, I am told, the single most visited cultural site in the country of Cuba. And the museum, the Museo Hemingway is, is cherished by them. And there's actually a joint Cuban and American project uh, to deal with preservation issues there. So it's a real intercultural you know, success story. If you want to talk to a group of people who are frustrated by the Cuban embargo, Hemingway scholars will probably pretty much all fit into that category. Um, only 90 miles apart. Um, yeah, we probably could just throw in Princeton, which has the Scribner archives, but the Hemingway collection is absolutely matchless. And I never forget going in there as a graduate student at that conference and going, my God, this is like King Tut's tomb in here. <laughs> you know, nothing had been published at that point. All right, I'm going to mute and let Hillary. <laughs> uh oh. Some of, some of the other places that, that claim Hemingway quite rightly, um, the Ernest Hemingway Foundation of Oak Park in Oak Park, Illinois has restored his birthplace to its original Victorian glory. They have a few things that belonged to the Hemingway family. Uh, there's a very active group of Hemingway scholars and aficionados in Michigan. They sort of orbit the Clark Historical Library at CMU. They've got a gem of a Hemingway collection. That's on my bucket list. That's where I want to go next. Um, Hemingway's second wife's family home is in Piggott, Arkansas. There's a museum there. And of course, you know, your Hemingway life is not complete unless you've gone to Key West and seen the cat. Oh, and then there's also, it's like everywhere. And then if you just, if you, if you want to really, if you really want to rough it Hemingway style, get your copy of Movable Feast, go on the budget of a graduate student, and you can use it as a walking guide to expatriate Paris left bank. You know, maybe once we can all travel again, that'll inspire some people to do that. You know, they have plaques and things on various buildings that Gertrude Stein's house, Hemingway's first apartment, um, but you can just literally use a movable feast and tour Paris with Hemingway. I have to so. say a word about Hemingway in Maine. Um, <clears throat> Colby College has the collections of Waldo Pierce, who was an artist that Hemingway was close friends with. And um, Waldo traveled in Europe with Hemingway, uh, went to visit him in Key West and was a phenomenal painter. So Colby not only has all of their correspondence and they were great, great letters between uh, the two of them about all these things. And they're very funny and coarse and raunchy and full of artistic stuff. They plan to do a book together on deep sea fishing, um, but they also have these scrapbooks that Waldo made when he visited Hemingway. So there's a Key West scrapbook for instance, and it's full of like watercolor sketches and drawings. Um, there's one from the bullfights in Pamplona that Waldo did. It's, it's called um, Don Ernesto in Pamplona. And it, and it has, again, watercolor sketches. Colby also has a phenomenal collection of American art, including a lot of Waldo's paintings. And there's a great one um, of, the, of the bullfights at Pamplona and this whole crowd pouring into a ring and the bulls running them over. And, so that's, that's probably the chief jewel of the Hemingway in Maine collection. But the Ogunquit Museum of Art uh, was founded by Mike Strader, who is also an artist friend of Hemingway's and they have a wonderful Hemingway portrait. And my favorite thing in Maine and probably my favorite museum in Maine is the Elsie Bates Museum in Hinckley, which is a really old time 
Natural History Museum that has unchanged really since the beginning of the 20th century. And they have got a blue marlin caught by Ernest Hemingway in their natural history collection. And it's, it's the only animal, there, there are lots of stuffed heads um, of animals that Hemingway shot, but this is the only species specimen he collected that is in a natural history museum. And it's so worth the drive up there to see it. And it's not very far from Colby. So if you wanted to make a Hemingway in Maine field trip, that would be, that would be the way to go, Colby and, and the Bates Museum. <laughs> Um, well, we have hit 8 p.m., uh, so I don't want to, and, and we still have a lot of questions, um, but I, I really don't want to go too far over the promised end time of 8, just because uh, every Zoom gets very long after 8 o'clock. Um, but I would like to close with, uh, everybody has a couple, there's a there's a theme about the novels. Um, one one um, person asked if you rec and I think we'll close on this. Well, uh, do you recommend any order of reading Hemingway's novels? And then, of course, the last one we could, should throw a softball and ask you both: What are your favorite and least favorite novels? So, I I never know what to tell people when they ask me which Hemingway novel they should read because they're all so different. So the question is. Where do you want to go? You know, do you want to go to Paris in the 1920s, then read A Movable Feast, which is, of course, not a novel? Do you want to go to the bullfights? Um, do you want to read a tragic romance of World War I? Um, do you want to go, you know, to Paris and Pamplona and hang out with these crazy lost generation types, then read Sun Also Rises? Do you want to go to the Michigan woods, then you want to read the Nick Adams stories and read in our time? Um, do you want to hunt a giant marlin in a small boat with a subsistence fisherman then go to Old Man of Sea? I mean, it's really, really, it's up to you, really, where you want to go. So I think you just need to find yourself a library bookshelf or a bookshelf in a bookstore and pull them off and uh, read the jackets and, um, and make your choice. You, you probably won't be sorry. Um, I always tell people my favorite Hemingway book is the one that I read most recently, reread most recently, because every time I read them again, they become more wonderful. Um, my least favorite novel is Across the River and Into the, Into the Trees. Um, I, I just, the May-December thing I think is very self-indulgent um, and when you use the word creepy, although there are beautiful passages of writing in there too. Um, but yeah, Hunter. he did some of his most beautiful writing about the natural world in Across the River and Into the Trees. It's a shame there's this pesky plot that you have to, <laughs> you know, kind of deal with to make it through. I'm with you on Across the River and Into the Trees. Some of the writing is gorgeous, but I'd like to take, you know, selected paragraphs and forget the plot. The duck hunting in the Venetian lagoons is beautiful. Or Adriana drying her hair in front of the fire is beautiful, but ugh, the rest of it, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> mm, yeah. Do you have a favorite, Hillary? Yeah, I do. Um, my favorite Hemingway is actually not a novel. My favorite Hemingway is the last paragraph of Indian Camp. Ooh. which ends in the, in the, I'm not gonna get it as well as Jeff Daniels, but it's the boy sitting in the boat and the mist is coming off the water and he's got his hand in the water and it's warm. Um, and it ends with his father rowing. He felt quite sure that he would never die. And that's a novel in a sentence right there. So that's, that's my favorite. Well, I, I think that's a wonderful way to <laughs> wonderful way to end this evening, although I think we could go on for a lot longer. Um, yeah, there's but, so many questions, great questions that are yeah, still there's out there. A lot so. of great questions sorry, out everybody. there. And I'm really sorry that we're we're really not gonna get to them all because if we if we started to do even one or two more, we're gonna go another 20, 25 minutes. And I think um, I think it's time to sign off. Um, thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so much, Hillary. And um and maybe we can have a part two sometime <laughs> um, so that people um, uh, people can get these questions in that we didn't get in tonight.
All right. Okay. But good night, everybody. Thank you. Have a lovely weekend and um, uh, get out your Hemingway. <laughs> <laughs> Bye -bye. Good night. Good, good night. night. Thank you.